Hello, and welcome to What Langston Did. My name is Chelsea Shannon. I'm an editor at the University of New Orleans Press. I want to first say thank you to the Library of America and the Schomburg Center for Re Research and Black Culture for their initiative, Lift Every Voice, a nationwide celebration of African American poetry. It's through Lift Every Voice that we're able to offer this craft talk, and the press is very proud to be part of this programming. Thank you to Candace Huber, who's handling tech tonight, and to my colleagues at the press for their support, especially Alex Demeff for editing tonight's interview footage. Also to the UNO professors who introduced me to some of the text discussed later on, thank you Dr. Ni Oshindari, Dr. Ann Boyd Rue, and Dr. Elizabeth Stebe. Lastly, thank you to Winta Gurmai, our videographer whose work we'll see in just a moment. But first, I want to introduce Kalamu, who will join us later. Activist, educator, filmmaker, writer, editor, and poet, Kalamu Yasalam is the author of numerous books and pamphlets. His latest publications include The Magic of Juju, An Appreciation of the Black Arts Movement, New Orleans Griot, The Tom Dent Reader, I Am New Orleans, and Cosmic Deputy. His recordings include the CD, My Story, My Song, and his films include Baby Love. A well-known activist and social critic, he has worked to affect change on a number of human rights and racial justice issues. Kalamu is also, along with Ayo Fayemi Robinson, co-editor of Runnegate Press. I've had the privilege of working with Kalamu on all four of his UNO Press titles so far. For Cosmic Deputy, it was very special to help Kalamu select poems from over 50 years of writing. I was deeply moved by Art for Life, My Story, My Song, the collection's long introductory essay in which Kalamu inventories influences from his earliest days as an artist. He writes that as a young person, quote, Langston Hughes was one side in the triangle of my conscious self-development. My civil rights involvement, picketing and sitting in, was the second side. My interest in blues and jazz completed the triangle, end quote. Kalamu's experience of Hughes is interwoven with music and with Black community, just as Hughes's work could not have existed without blues, jazz, and community in Harlem and abroad. In Blues Legacies and Black Feminism, Angela Davis writes that the abolition of slavery, quote, created a backdrop for new kinds of relationships between Black individuals, and thus for a different valuation of the individual in general, end quote. The blues were the, quote, aesthetic evidence of new psychosocial realities, end quote. In the music of early blues women, quote, the experience of freedom was sought in the journey itself. The experience of freedom was sought in the journey itself, end quote. As Black people nurtured new communities beyond enslavement, individual experiences of freedom through art were exchanged more freely the community growing more referential and more polyphonous. In an essay on Langston Hughes, Kalamu speaks to similar themes. Quote, those who consider Hughes a simple poet do not grasp the contradictions, the contrariness, and too often the confusions that inevitably color human emotional exchanges, which are at the core of Hughes's poetry. One does not become a poet of the people without both understanding people and at the same time being understood by people." End quote. The poetic integration of Black musical aesthetics is one way of honoring the ancestors who precede us. Winta Gurmai does a stunning job of depicting this in her book trailer for Cosmic Deputy. Let's watch. No art is completed until it is connected to the people. Everything of value I have ever experienced has been consummated in a social setting. And this is particularly true of art. Every expression 
requires a transmitter, a message, and a receiver. A transmitter, a message, and a receiver. And of course, whatever it takes to make all three work. In the West, the artist is severed from the audience. My art is incomplete without an audience because our culture is a culture of affirmation. The old folks used to say, when you enter a room, speak to the people who are already there. When we enter the room of black culture, we should speak to the ancestors. We should speak to the ancestors and we should expect to get a reply. After all, the ancients are culture. The ancients are cultured. They are culture and cultured and will surely respond when spoken to. Affirmation leads us to appreciate the continuum of life. Louis Armstrong would never have been whole, not to mention noble and bold, without the ancestors in his horn. Even when he blew notes that had never been blown before. By creating something new from something old, Lewis and Langston Hughes too, became ancestors of the future. These are the people we go back to in order to know who we are in the present. To be mature is to make yourself worthy of being an ancestor. To be mature is to make yourself worthy of being an ancestor. I really love that piece. Uh, so context or what happens when parts get excised from the whole is one of the ideas Kalamu and, touch, Kalamu and I touched on in our conversation. For example, take the first Hughes poem I and possibly you ever read, and I'm reading this from the African-American poetry reader, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Now, in the interview, you'll see me reference this poem somewhat dismissively, but what I really meant to dismiss was the way it was first presented to me. This poem, actually titled Harlem, is part of a book-length suite of poems, Montage of a Dream Deferred. It is unsurprising that the average American classroom shrinks from really unpacking Harlem, whether the piece's relationship to the whole or the abolitionist potential of its final line. Black art, plundered and marginalized historically and today, is a sacred inheritance strewn across attics, archives, and seafloors. It is a joy when parts of this inheritance get rediscovered, given fresh life. Likewise, their loss is another grief. Earlier this month, a forest fire displaced hundreds of people and destroyed part of the University of Cape Town's Jager Library. About 70,000 texts were destroyed including some of the library's rare history and African film collections. Was Langston Hughes, who corresponded with South African scholars and anti-apartheid activists for two decades, familiar with this library? That global connection isn't mentioned on his Wikipedia page. So with all grief, gravity, and gratitude in mind as ever, I'm proud to present my conversation with Kalamu. We'll have a brief intermission halfway through then a Q&A with Kalamu before closing with a poem. I hope you enjoy. 
Well, we're here today to talk about your patron saint of poetry, Langston Hughes. Yes. So, patron saint of, of writing. Of writing in general. That's right. Right. Yeah, we'll talk about that, not just the poetry. Yeah. However, that was your first encounter with him as an eighth grader in Mrs. Nelson's class. That's right. So I'm going to read that excerpt from Cosmic Deputy. Today, I am a poet, but I did not choose poetry. Poetry found me. I was in eighth grade. Mrs. O.E. Nelson baptized me. I had been in the water before, but until that day, I had never gotten religion. Mrs. Nelson dipped me beneath the waters by simply laying Langston Hughes on me. I received the word not from a book, not from my reading Hughes, but rather from hearing him, and hearing him with music, jazz no less, and blues. I was not prepared for the Langston Hughes recording because if this was poetry, then poetry was me. So that's in Cosmic Deputy, one of your latest books from the University yeah. of New Orleans Press. So I guess when I read that, I was struck by the fact that your first encounter wasn't on the page. It was hearing, he yeah. heard and so mixed up with music. So today I wanted to talk about Hughes, both as your patron saint of writing and as a blues writer. Yeah. and also what the blues has meant to you yeah. and all of those influences mix in together. Okay. So I also wanted to share a quote from the introduction of Blues Legacies and Black Feminism by Angela Davis. So just for some context. One might expect that because the classic blues era coincided with the Harlem Renaissance, this musical articulation of African-American culture would have been treated extensively by the writers and intellectuals of the day. However, because women like Bessie Smith and Ida Cox presented and embodied sexualities associated with working class black life, which fatally was seen by some Renaissance strategists as antithetical to the aims of their cultural movement. Their music was designated as low culture in contrast, for example, to endeavors such as sculpture, painting, literature, and classical music. Consequently, few writers with the notable exception of Langston Hughes who often found himself at odds with his contemporaries, were willing to consider seriously the contributions of blues performers made to black cultural politics. So with that in mind, first I just wanna ask, what do you think it was about Langston that made him see the blues as a worthy influence for his writing? And what are some of the other ways he was set apart from his contemporaries? He was not college educated. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's that simple. Yeah. <laughs> he was not well, college can't... educated because what they were teaching in college, let me take this off, start all over again. Okay. He was not, Langston Hughes was not college educated. Mm -hmm. And that marked him as different from most of his contemporaries who claim or aspire to be writers. Um, that being non-college educated means he had not sat for four years in a classroom and somebody beaten in his head. You're not supposed to act that way. You're supposed to act this way. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not supposed to talk like that. You're supposed to talk like this. He didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So I think what he relied on was just his feelings. Uh, plus, he worked um, as a porter, mm -hmm. bus boy, mm -hmm. worked on a ship and what have you. Mm -hmm. And when he had first went to Europe, had thrown a lot of the books he had into the harbor. Oh. Uh -oh. Yeah, and got on the ship and, okay. and worked his way. So he was not of, he didn't have as I said, a college education. He was not of that training. Mm -hmm. So he responded to what he felt. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I think. I stand to be corrected. I didn't study his, you know, enough about his life in contradistinction from his contemporaries. Mm -hmm to be able to fully answer that question. Oh, you know, well, this guy had, and this woman had, but he mm -hmm. had, I, I didn't, I didn't do that. Sure. I'm just giving you my impression, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from my, you know, from the perspective I have about that. 
Okay. Well, we could go in one or two directions there. But you said he didn't have the training that some of his contemporaries did. I wouldn't call it training. Yeah. I would call it indoctrination. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> training is a polite way to say that. I don't want to be polite. I want, that's what, <laughs> he was not indoctrinated. But yeah. at the same time, over the years, here was a guy who's not college educated ends up fluent in three languages. Yeah. And Come doing on. like all types of writing. Right. As we said, it wasn't yeah. just the poetry, even though that's how he's mostly remembered. Yeah. He was a journalist, translator. Did he do any editing? I thought, you know. A little bit, but not. Okay. Not significant. His editing was more advice to writers in other um, um, disciplines, other um languages. Mm -hmm. I have a book that has his um, letters to South African writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? A rich correspondent too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a global one. So, you know, he, he wasn't indoctrinated in the one sense, but in, in another sense, he was really learned in terms of his interaction with various, uh, cultures, various people, and other writers. Mm -hmm. Which, when I say various people, I, I, I should make sure people understand that he um, had interaction with workers, people literally porters and, and, and what have you. Right. So he was comfortable with that. Right. I wanted to talk about the hybridity of Hughes's influences mm -hmm. and kind of going off of all of this. There's a quote from Cosmic Deputy uh, that you had about the two trains of black poetry. Yeah. Um, so from the very beginning, black poetry has consisted of two trains running. Mm -hmm. One train accepted and emulated the Eurocentric literary traditions and the other train rejoices in and propagated the folk-based, orated, indigenously developed African-American expressions. Right. This is not simply a question of theme or content, but also a question of technique. And that actually, here's a quote from a Hughes poem that kind of responds to that. Mm -hmm. So this was in, it's from Montage of a Dream Deferred, Deferred yeah. from the theme for English B portion, yeah. which is in the African-American poetry reader. So that line that caught me, is I like a pipe for a Christmas present or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. Yeah. So my question to you is, did Hughes ride both trains? Did he prefer one or the other? Because that line to there means that line there sounds to me like he was kind of familiar with both trains, or at least he's saying that he was. I think he knew about it, but I don't think when he um gave gifts to people when he traveled about. I don't believe he had no Bach records with it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was just for the, um, what's that, alliteration? No, no, it wasn't just alliteration. Uh -huh. The alliteration was there. Mm -hmm. But it was also a way of saying, I'm not stupid. Mm -hmm. I know about and I know, you know, Beethoven is important musically, mm -hmm. you know, but I like Bob and I like Bessie. Yeah, Bessie. You know, mm -hmm. and there's a difference between liking and only knowing one thing and liking and knowing the totality of things and you choose what part of it you like. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's a big difference mm -hmm. because it means it's one thing not to know Beethoven and Bach. Right. And not and not like it. You don't even know you don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, or know why you don't like it. But Hughes knew that and at the same time made a decision. Mm -hmm. And that's what's critical about Langston Hughes. He decided to be black. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. And again, I go go back to partly because he wasn't college educated. That is, he didn't finish. He wasn't. Um, they didn't sandpaper for the rough edges <laughs> of his intelligence and pump him up mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. bullshit. You know, 
Okay, interesting. Um, I don't know. So in that same essay about Hughes, you sent, you describe, you say that his militancy, his political militancy, is generally downplayed in popular biographies of him. And I would just say, from my own experience, my first encounter with him, I think, was also in eighth grade. Actually, yeah. um, I went to a majority white middle school. He was definitely held up as just like a black poet of the past, yeah. and you know, nothing deeper than that. Kind of held in um, a safe, tame kind of space. So I guess my question is, why? Why? <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a saying. Mm -hmm. In fact, Gil Scott Harris used to say it all the time. If they knew that, why would they tell you? <laughs> that sums up my education. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes. What, and I'm saying the education of, of, of people in general in this society. Yeah. Why would they tell you? If they knew, and they did know, Langston Hughes went to Spain during the Civil War, mm -hmm. reporting on that. Mm -hmm. Langston Hughes was a strong supporter of the, of the campaign around the Scottsboro boys. Why would, they why would they make that? Why would any establishment person want that to be what defines Langston Hughes for you? Right. It's not in their interest. Mm -hmm. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did want to. <laughs> I wanted to lift up Masters of the Do a bit too, uh, which you wrote about, and yeah. you said that if people knew that he had supported, not just supported, but literally translated and made that book more available yeah. when he did, like that itself characterizes so much of where his politics. Jacques were. Romain was the one of the founding uh, members of the uh, Communist Party in 80. Mm -hmm. And uh, Frederico Lorca in Spain mm -hmm. um, was trans translated by Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. And that's, is, he's not just a writer in the sense of a creative writer in one language. Mm -hmm. He's also a translator. And he's political, mm -hmm. and he does he he he's done more in non English languages than half the critics who talk about him have done in the language they they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And once you learn that, then you you find yourself reassessing what the so called experts know. Yes. Which is what they don't want, <laughs> <laughs> and and you and you, you may not become a fan of Hughes or anybody else, but you do start to say, well, I wonder why that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know that. Why they didn't teach us that about it? you know? Yep. You just think this is just how it is. This yeah. is just how education goes. Right. Yeah. That also, I don't know, just the idea of like Harlem Renaissance writers being held as like the poster writers, right. even like over like the last century or plus, yeah. you know, it's like, those are the American black writers, right. quote unquote. It's like, same thing that happens with civil rights and like- Everything. Yes, everything. There's always like the poster child and then everyone else, the fullness of everything else that exists around. And part of it, off. part of it is an attempt to limit us to being about protest literature. Mm, yeah. Or today, black pain, it's like, still protest literature. Yeah, but like I feel like it's a more a stronger emphasis on pain and torture, kinda. Like, especially in film and TV. Well, part of it has to do with there's been so much pain and torture inflicted upon us. Right. And so it ref it reflects a part of our reality. Right. But how is it held? But to present that as our total reality right. is a big, big, big mistake. Yeah. So to present the Harlem Renaissance as the summation of uh, quote unquote African-American literature post Phyllis Wheatley 
as like we went from Phyllis Wheatley to the Harlem Renaissance. Give right. me a break. Right, right, right. You think you know Langston Hughes? Right. The Negro speaks of rivers. Right, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> Yes, and um, what happens to a dream to fur, <laughs> yeah. which is so, you know, I mean, it's an important poem, but it also is so, like, it's foreclosed. Right. Like, the, the Black condition in America is deferred. That's what we learned. That's yes. what he had to say. That's right. it. Right. And I yeah. think it is, I mean, intentional that yeah. we don't know about the breadth and depth of all that he did. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's because that's the only way they can make him safe. Good evening. Tonight, Mr. Langston Hughes, American poet, dramatist, novelist, lyricist, lecturer. He's in town to give a lecture at UBC, but he's here tonight to read poetry, his own poetry, to a jazz accompaniment. We have Alan Miller to interview him. We have Doug Parker and his band to provide the jazz. And Mr. Langston Hughes has his own accompaniment, his own introduction. <laughs> what I'm gonna sing. Sun's a setting. This is what I'm gonna sing. I feel the blues are coming. I wonder what the blues will bring. Rocking back and forth to a mellow croon, I heard a Negro play. Down on Lenox Avenue the other night, by the pale, dull pallor of a one bulb light, he did a lazy sway. He did a lazy sway to the tune of those weary blues. With his ebony hands on each ivory key, he made that poor piano moan with melody. Oh, blue. Swaying to and fro on his rickety stool, he played that sad, raggy tune like a musical fool. Sweet blue, coming from a black man's soul. Oh, blue. deep song voice with a melancholy tone. I heard that Negro sing, that old piano moan. Ain't got nobody in all this world. Ain't got nobody but myself. I was going to quit my frowning and put my troubles on the shelf. Thump, 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 when he's put on the floor. He played a few chords and he sang some more. I got the weary blues, I can't be satisfied. Got the weary blues, I can't be satisfied. I ain't happy no more, and I wish that I had died. Far into the night, he crooned that tune. The stars went out, and so did the moon. The singer stopped playing and went to bed. While the weary blues echoed through his head, he slept like a rock or a man that's dead.
I've as black Americans, you know, yeah. Americans a squishy identifier, mm. but in terms of our passports, yeah, um, we don't even know where that archive began, right? And like that is a really deep question. Langston is my patron saint, but I'm not gonna say that there wasn't no religious people before him. <laughs> All right, I hear that. All right. You know. mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I don't know. We could talk about a couple other ways he was kind of connected to the collective. I mean, we've talked about his translating work and kind of coming off of that. Antho I, he did anthologies and that's anthologies, important. Anthologies, yes. That's important. Like you were reading from that anthology, this recent anthology. Yes. That uh, uh, Young did, mm -hmm. Kevin Young did. Um, I got into literature when I first started reading Langston Hughes. That was one of the things. On it, he and Arnold Bonson did a, a, a major anthology. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really impressive. What's impressive? That they were able to pull that together without all the like ways of finding people and compiling and communicating. There was so much going on, and what most people, what many academics. And it was academics who studied and, and made the quote unquote um, Harlem Renaissance as the paragon of black literature. Mm -hmm. And those people don't even talk about Les L, which was before, quite before, quite like way before, you know, yeah. before that. They don't talk about the whole um, advent of of um, during Reconstruction, mm. when you had black papers and and you had women writing, uh, oh. Alice Dunbar Nelson. Yeah, they don't talk about her. No, but she was writing about a lot of these things before the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Again, Langston Hughes validates, and in certain senses holds up as a hero of his work, women. Yes, and that's something I wanted to talk about. <laughs> like, I was struck in the selections in the anthology, yeah. many of them, you know, relatively many of them are persona poems from a woman's perspective. Yeah. And I noticed the same of some of your poems. I wondered if that was an influence for you. Not consciously, but mm -hmm. uh, but obviously it, it laid the foundation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Hughes's uh, Madam Alberta K. Mm -mm. That's Madam to you. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. She was, she's tough. And she, he has a whole section of poems in her voice. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then just to talk about some Susanna Wears Red and mm -hmm. Life for Me Ain't Been No Crystal Stair. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it goes, it's deep. It is deep. And the sweet flypaper of life, which yeah. I hadn't heard of until I read Cosmic Deputy. But oh. that's a photo book. With yeah. Raw de cover out. Yeah. Yeah. And so the very end of that, so it's like pictures, and Hughes did the text to the pictures right. to tell a story using, it's de Caraba. Yeah. De Caraba's photos. So it's like a narrative with pictures and text on each page. And it's from the point of view of a black woman, yeah. a grandmother. Yeah. And at the very end, you see it's her, her picture. And she says, yeah. here I am. And it's like, here you are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say, and no, there's no other. There are very few contemporary male writers and no other male writers of that period that would have a book with a woman as the hero. Yeah. It was very striking. And at first I was like, will we see her? You yeah. know, because she's looking at other people, yeah. but will we see her? And we do. It's like she's the end. She's the, the finale. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm saying, mm -hmm. Hughes don't get no credit for that. Mm. You know? None that I ever heard. <laughs> yeah. But at, who else has done a photograph book and uh, validated women because mm -hmm. it's like she is his lens you know yeah. of course he's the one writing about the pictures the portraits that he sees but like she's the lens that he chooses it's, it's deeper than that mm -hmm. it's my understanding from my study as you know i was interested in, in photography before mm -hmm. 
um, literature. But it's my understanding that what had happened was Roy had a bunch of photographs. And he said to Langston, here, do something. Okay. With it. You can do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. It was Langston who conceptualized the whole thing. It wasn't wow. that the cover said, I took these pictures of this woman and her family and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he had, no, he just gave Langston a bunch of pictures. So think of it this way. Mm -hmm. Langston's got all these pictures. We don't know the full extent of, of we, know what's, we know what's in the book, but we don't know the full extent. Right. But he decided, Langston Hughes decides to make it from the point of view of a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. Her picture was just one of <laughs> however many. Yeah. 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 Think yeah. about what that means. I mean, what kind of, oh, man, you know, that's. It's deep. And it shows his investment in the collective. Yeah. And not only the collective, the feminine. It's, it's just having a broad view of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, that is very true. Oh, also just to say with the collective, I know that Hughes mentored a lot of younger writers and mm -hmm. like cared about reaching down to the younger generation too. And not, and not just here. Mm -hmm. He was interested in younger writers all over, particularly black writers, but not exclusively. Langston Hughes had two anthologies of African literature, African treasury, and uh, I think black poems or black poetry from black poems from Africa, I think it was. Okay, wow. Find one of his contemporaries that has anthologies of African literature. Yeah. Well, I guess with Hughes having a global perspective and a a pan-African perspective, mm -hmm. kind of, I don't want to say for the first time, but like he was, I think he was different in that among his contemporaries. Is that accurate? I think among his celebrated Harlem Renaissance contemporaries. Yeah. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas they were more like nationalistic or like- There were, other, there were so many other writers, mm -hmm. thinkers of, of that period and before that period that our people have. And we're only taught about the safe Negroes, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, when I say safe, I mean, they were not overtly anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. So you take somebody like Claude McKay, who is often thought of as a major uh, Harlem Renaissance writer, he left the United States, uh, I want to say 1918, maybe 17, probably 18 or 19. Ends up in the Soviet Union right. and doesn't come back till the Harlem Renaissance is kaput. Right. But he's held up as one of the main Harlem Renaissance writers. Right, right. And he right. wasn't. He wasn't. He just, <laughs> he rolled in late. Yeah. <laughs> And his novel, speaking of everything that's unknown and lost, right. that novel about the Soviet Union was just recently discovered. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's why, that's why I pulled back. I just think American exceptionalism is a dead end and people pick it up so easily without realizing that that's what they're picking up. Mm -hmm. And I firmly reject black or uh, Negro ex exceptionalism, mm -hmm. which is just the outhouse attached to American exception. right. <laughs> except uh -huh. exceptionalism. The result being some kind of way we think we are better than, different from, and not just different from, but actually better or superior to black folk. Mm -hmm. all around the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we won't articulate that out loud, mm -hmm. but when we start talking, you can hear it yeah. and you can see it. And, and until it's pointed out, it's invisible. 
because we think that's the way it is. Right. And when I was in uh, uh, England, one of the one of the time, one of the number of times I was in England, I believe it was in in, in uh, Manchester. Could be wrong. It was not in London, but somebody. I was there during October. I think it's October when they have uh, their Black History celebrations okay. and what have you. And one of the people was talking about Phyllis Wheatley. Mm. And of course, you know, I re immediately responded as I've been trained to respond. Well, Phyllis Wheatley was an African American and said that she was a British subject. Mm. And that's the first time I said, damn, I realized though, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. they didn't have to break it further down to me, but I realized that's when I, my whole thing about American except, exceptionalism. I'd been so ingrained in it, mm -hmm. even as much as I was an active member of the civil rights, I'd sit in, been arrested, you know, so forth and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. I was a black nationalist at, at that point, mm -hmm. you know, thought that, you know, um, I was not an American, I'm a black, you know, right. we want a black nation. And I, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've been indoctrinated this way. Mm -hmm. And so I cannot even recognize reality. <laughs> yeah, 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 I hear that. You know? Uh huh. And so that's when I really started interrogating myself, not just about what happens or, or what we can do to make our situation better. Mm -hmm. But what is our real situation? Yes. Who are we? <laughs> Let's start with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which I don't know, with to that point, I guess we were earlier talking about Hughes's contemporaries and how they didn't necessarily yeah. have a diasporic or like Pan-African perspective. Yeah. And meanwhile, Hughes was critiquing America, like critiquing yeah. the United States right. with let America be America again. America was never no America, America to me. Yeah. Like he was already on that. So. Yeah, he was already he was already there. Mm -hmm. He he Langston. It's important to realize. Let me, let me see if I can articulate what I'm about to say. In one sense, he was unique. Mm -hmm. But everywhere he went, he found fellows that he could get along with in the world. Mm -hmm. So who was, was he really unique? Or were the Negroes that were up in the big house unique? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. that, I would flip that. That's, those are the unique people uh -huh. in the world. Mm -hmm. They think they're exceptional. Wow. Wow, yeah, I get that. You articulated. <laughs> <laughs> I felt it. Shoot, okay. And I'm saying it's not, it's not their fault. Sure. They've been indoctrinated that way. Mm -hmm. And, but, and not even realize, they didn't realize they were indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the, the key element. So I guess that my last question is, would you say that Hughes could be a catalyst to break out of that indoctrination? No. No. Because he didn't politicize it. Mm. He didn't articulate that that's what, what it was. Somebody has to break that down to you. Mm -hmm. um, the value of somebody like Angela Davis is that not only was she um, oppressed, but she could articulate it and we can understand. And she led us to believe certain things. Mm -hmm. So we need that, that articulation. Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, now we're gonna open up the floor for a Q and A, or you know, if you have a question or a comment for Kalamu, um, he's gonna join us. Hey Kalamu. Hey, what's nothing much? How you doing? Oh, it got to be something. 
You got your <laughs> hand in. <dear. laughs> <laughs> this, <is a laughs> this right here. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking. Yeah. I know one of my friends had a question for you. They haven't submitted it yet, but I do have some folks watching who are into our conversation, and it was a treat to see it again. Hmm. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate you doing it. You know, a lot of um, a lot of folk wouldn't sat that sat there that long and let me go on and on about <laughs> being Negroes. You know, <laughs> they just wouldn't do it. I love it. Um, I guess one follow up question I have that we didn't necessarily address was that Langston Hughes has been your patron saint for a long time. And I wonder, it's kind yes. of a big question, but I wonder how it's changed over the course of your life and career as you yourself did more and more types of writing and were connected to different literary communities and all that. Like, how have you seen Hughes differently over the years? My appreciation has gotten deeper and deeper because the more I learn, the more I write, and the more I study about Langston Hughes, and there's always some more you can learn. You know, they all and books coming out on Langston Hughes uh, mm -hmm. by various people, and particularly once I, I, I began to open my own eyes beyond my own feelings and say, well, wait a minute, maybe there's more to it than I thought. And part of it is just getting old, you know, I'm so-called elder, that's a, a euphemism for old man. Um, <laughs> after you've been around a while, you stop thinking that your youthful self knows a lot. <laughs> yes. You know what <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? When we, at every stage in human existence, in the, in the cycle of human existence, we think we know. Mm -hmm. When we're a baby, we, they're playing with our hands and feet and what have you, and we think we know that, you know? Mm -hmm. And we grow into a toddler, and we're walking around the house or wherever we are and discovering things, and we think we know that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I could go on through the various state, and you, you see how, how, what happened. Yeah. We are, are we conceive of our knowledge as a reflection of our environment. And it's mm -hmm. only after we realize there's more to our environment than we know that we can begin to know anything. Yes. Because yes. Until that, until that happens, all we know is what we were brought up in. And that's so limited. Mm -hmm. It's so limited to be an individual. It's so limited to be ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? You got to get yes. out of that. Yes. You know? Yes. Hmm. Thank you for that. I'm going to see what kind of paper. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to see what, what, what you do with that. Because <laughs> you, I mean, you know, you, you, you're, in a, you're in a position where you, you um, a lot of people don't realize you one of the main editors over at UNO Press. You went to college, and you you got your degree now, right? Mm -hmm. and, yep. and so you're on a track to do something. So the real question is, what you gonna do? <laughs> um, I'm gonna yep. read you this little short poem called Motto, M O T T O, Langston Hughes. Short. Wonderful. I play it cool. I play it cool. And dig all jive. That's the reason I stay alive. <laughs> My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. 
So the motto is dig and be dug. You yes. can't be dug if you don't dig. Right. You got to dig to be dug. Right. Yes. You please start audience. Is, would you be able to, Yeah, <laughs> Mohan says, uh, would you be able to read some of your own poetry that you feel speaks closely to slash from Langston Hughes? And if I was being uh, uh, catty about it, I would say, yeah, I could do that. But that's not what he's asking. He's asking me to read some stuff. He's not asking me, could I read some stuff? He's asking me to read. And I'm saying that because that's an indication of how language, how language uh, uh, circumscribes us. Mm -hmm. And in the American sense, we are taught to circumscribe what we really mean with this bullshit language. Yes. Um, you know what I'm yes. And yeah. so, and so it, it is. It is uncultured to come right out and say what you really mean if mm -hmm. you are educated. You're supposed to use euphemisms, right? The less direct, you're better. You're supposed to. Yes. <laughs> and I'm not accusing uh, a Mohan of being educated. I mean, that's not, I'm not accusing but my brother. I'm not accusing you of that, even though you may be. I don't, you know, well, I do know because he's teachers. But um, the point is that we have to break past how we've been educated if we're going to do something different from what is already here. If not, all we're going to do is repeat what we have. Right. Okay. Thank so you. to answer the question, yeah, we'll get to some of that later on. Mm. You know, some of my own stuff. But that ain't that ain't no that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about Langston Hughes. That is true. Come and on. We got another Chelsea, I know you got some <laughs> what advice would you have for black writers who write from for the black experience and diaspora? Same advice. Get beyond it. You can't be yourself until you know everything else. You know, one of the things I used to tell people in, in, in our workshop is uh, if you want to be a writer, learn something deeply about something other than writing. Mm. Because in learning something deeply about something else, you open yourself to the world. If you only focus on what you want, you know, you stay clustered around your particular feelings and ideas and stuff like that, which are always limited. Going back to that baby with the hand, mm -hmm. you know, that baby with the hand didn't even realize, he didn't realize he was in a tub. She didn't realize she was in a crib, you know, mm -hmm. a crib, excuse me, crib. You know, you don't. You just don't know. You think, no. hey, there's so much out there. Oh, look at my hand. Oh, that's my hand. Oh, look at that. You know. Oh, I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. And somebody, <laughs> and and this milk just drops on me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> intellectually, intellectually, most of us are babies. Yes. I'm, what's next? <laughs> well, I see what's that. Next? Yes. Uh, Mohan expressed gratitude for the reading. Um, yeah, I don't know. We have a couple more minutes for questions or comments, and then I'm going to close us with a poem, as I stated. But I don't know. Well, I, I have guess another poem here. Uh, Langston. Before, yeah. Before you want this, is Langston, this is Langston Hughes, and this is the poem that got me started writing. Mm. Mrs. Nelson. Eighth grade. Mm -hmm. It's called Ballad of the Man Who's Gone by Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. No money to bury him. The, re the relief gave 44. The undertaker told him, You need 60 more. Mm -hmm. 
Imagine that. You're, mm-hmm. you're on the you're on the dole at that, well the relief at that point in history, and they give you forty four, but it takes a hundred to get embarrassed. So back to the yeah. point. For a first class, it takes you need sixty more for a first class funeral, a hearse, and two cars, and maybe your friends. Or send some flowers. Mm. His wife took a paper and went around. Everybody that gives something, she put them down. Mm-mm. She raped up a hundred for her man that was dead. His buddies brought flowers. A funeral was had. A minister preached and charged five to bless him dead and praise him alive. Mm. Now that he's buried, God rest his soul. Reckon there's no charge for a graveyard mold. Mm. I wonder what makes a funeral so high. A poor man ain't got no business to die. Mm. When I heard that that last line, a poor man ain't got no business to die. Mm-hmm. I said, Damn, that's it. And yeah. I went straight from classroom to the library. And hence, that was the beginning of um, my, my the only religion I, I, I profess. That's the religion of uh, St. Langston Hughes. You got to understand, those of you who are listening, when I went to the library and asked for Langston Hughes, I thought I was going to see, you know, three or four, maybe, you know, two or three, but maybe three or four poetry books. And I went to the shelf where the librarian told me to go, and it was, let me see, where was the, I got to get, it was so wide, I couldn't wrap my arms around it. <laughs> I said, well, I... I, I guess I got to deal with it if that's what it is. You get so started. Yeah. He did so many things. Mm-hmm. He did so many books and everything. And he opened up so many worlds to me. So by the time I finished going through Langston Hughes, simultaneously, I had also gone through all of the Harlem Renaissance, mm-hmm. a lot of the progressive, of course, American writers, John DePasso's, E.E. E. Cummings, and so, so forth. I mean, because of Langston Hughes. Mm-hmm. Writers mm-hmm. from the Caribbean, writers in Europe, writers in Asia, particularly China and mm-hmm. Japan. All this and and all of Africa. Langston Hughes opened all of that up for me. So that's mm-hmm. that's that's what I'm saying. That you know. My motto as I live and learn is dig and be dug in return. You got to dig to be dug. It's it's so true. Uh, Thank you for that. I think we have one more question and then we'll move towards closing. Um, Candice, yeah. So Lyd Smith asks, Mr. Salam, you mentioned several of Langston Hughes' works that are not so widely shared, especially in classrooms in the U.S., would you be willing to share what book or collections of Hughes you wish was read in middle school and high school classrooms today? Sweet Fly Paper of Life, um, because it it forces people to see a world diff- to see the world differently than to think of the world just as strict autobiography. We think of much of literature as autobiography. This, these are the words of a poet, whether it's, you know, that, that uh, um, I, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying not to offend too many people at one time, but that Anglo-Saxon nationalist Shakespeare. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> I see, you know, I mean, he's cool, but I mean, he's only writing about a part of humanity. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And think yeah. of this, during Shakespeare time, during Shakespeare time, black people were in the world. Mm-hmm. In England too. Yeah. But you'd never know it reading Shakespeare. Right. 
You know, you never, you never know it. And so what I'm saying is uh, when I'm, I'm asked about what to read, Sweet Fly Paper of Life is one thing, and his autobiographies. Because if you read The Big C and I Wonder as I Wander, if you read those mm -hmm. two books, oh. then you'll be turned on to so many other things to go to. Mm -hmm. And what he was, is not just about what he's writing, it's about the world he's opening you up to. Right. So that's, uh, that's what, that's what be, that would be my recommendation. I don't know if there's anybody else out there listening. I mean, you know, because <laughs> me and Chelsea could talk all day long, but I mean. Yeah, it, it's intimate and I appreciate that. But I don't know. Thank you so much, Kalamu, for those answers and for the whole conversation that we had. And this has just been such an opportunity for me to dive into Hughes in a deeper way. Um, and now I am going to move us towards closure. Um, okay. I hope everyone enjoyed this. I've really relished um, having the opportunity to speak to those in the room of this virtual program. Um, but I also didn't want to close tonight before we honor some people who became ancestors far before their time. So in honor of Makia Bryant, uh, Adam Toledo, Tamir Rice, Ayanna Stanley Jones, and all other black and brown children whose lives have been stolen by police violence and for their families, we close tonight with Hughes's dream variations. To fling my arms wide in some place of the sun, to whirl and to dance till the white day is done, then rest a cool evening beneath a tall tree while night comes on gently, dark like me. That is my dream. To fling my arms wide in the face of the sun, dance whirl, whirl till the quick day is done, rest at pale evening a tall, slim tree, night coming tenderly, black like me. So thanks for being with us tonight. I hope everyone has a great rest of their evening. <laughs>